Hi, everyone. My name is Kirk Bachman, and welcome back to The Ultimate Dish. In today's episode, I'm speaking with Chris Hill, a marketing executive turned entrepreneur and chef who has parlayed his passion for cooking into a personal brand with over 100,000 fans and growing. And he's got a fan right here. After five years of cutting his teeth in the culinary world, in his own establishment called Three Way, a sandwich bistro in Norfolk, Virginia, Chris sold his shares and began pursuing other ventures, culinary ventures. Today, Chris is a best-selling author, globe-trotting public speaker, and a consultant at the Culinary Institute of Virginia. Join me today as I chat with Chris about his transition into the kitchen, building a successful personal brand, and his passion for inspiring culinarians through writing and speaking. And there he is. Good morning, Chef. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Where are you? Are, are, are you in Virginia today? I, I am. Yeah. It looks like it's about to rain outside, but um, it's starting to feel a little bit like fall. So uh, no complaints. It is. It, you know, well, I, I'm here in Boulder, as you know, and um, mm -hmm. everybody's talking about fall, but it was 95 yesterday. <laughs> wow. Labor Day. It was just wow. insane. Hey, you know, before I dive in, I, I'm super excited to chat today. Um, but you know, this whole idea of building a successful brand, boy, I'm seeing that more and more and more. I mean, my kids are talking about it. Don't mess with my brand. When, wh wh where is this going? And is this real? And do you believe the, the idea of creating a brand is more important in the culinary world than ever before? Lots of eyes for on sure. chefs these days, right? Yeah, uh, for, for, for sure. And, and, you know, I think it started kind of with, the food network coming along and then obviously social media playing a big role um but you know, the, the way i look at it is and i actually wrote a book uh you can i think it's free on on amazon uh, crush your career but it's all about so if you and i are both looking for an investor for our uh oyster restaurant um and you uh are a great chef you uh know all about oysters but you don't really have anything out there that explains it versus i have a a blog where I have recipes. I have a, a, um, different articles where I talk about, you know, the different brininess and, and, you know, where different oysters come from. Um, I'm, I'm out there showing, you know, what I can do, what I know. And anyone at first, like if I'm looking for an investor, it's very obvious, you know, what, what I have to offer, but then also for, for customers, like um, it's just one step more to a little bit more compelling than, than just the, just being out there. Yeah, it's intentional and it and it and it's important, right? Yeah, more more than ever before, particularly with with social media. But uh, boy, so much to talk about today. I'm super super excited to have you on the show, Chris. And I I've really enjoyed learning about your journey, and mostly through this <laughs> through this incredible book, which is really beat to heck because I've been I've been showing it to a lot of people and and moving through it. I'll get to that in a minute. But <laughs> what I'm so appreciative of is your, it comes through in your written word, is your respect for the craft of cooking and, and the industry that we both love, right? That mm -hmm. That is so, so clear and appreciated. So thank you for that. You spend uh, much of your time talking to others about the industry. And I'm really excited to get you on the hot seat today. I'm going to ask your perspective uh, on the industry today. You've You've been called a modern uh, day renaissance man. Love that. Uh, who is equal parts uh, chef, entrepreneur, speaker, writer, and more than anything, you call yourself a student. I, I, I was saying to Mo earlier, can there be any more perfect guest uh, for Escoffier on The yeah. Ultimate Dish? Because this really says it all. We talk about entrepreneurship. We talk about being able to communicate in a thoughtful way, right? And what really resonates with me, Chris, is is your thirst for knowledge, quote unquote, and, and your mission to make the world a better place by studying the best of the best of the culinary world. So respectful. Absolutely love that. So, so that's where we'll start. You, you, you train, as I understand it, you transitioned from a career in marketing. Um, and a lot of chefs think they're a marketer, myself included. <laughs> Um, and, and and to this journey of becoming, you know, a cook, a chef. You you said that food was always a big part of your life, and I, and I love that position because for so many of us, food is important, and the stories are amazing. Cooking professionally, in particular, 
um, became a real passion for you. So can you take us back a little bit for those you haven't met, uh, even before the University of Alabama roll tide, did you always have a passion for cooking? And, and if you did, Mm -hmm. and, and I think I know where you're going to go, who, who, or, or what was the major influence uh, for you in the kitchen when you were younger? Yeah. I mean, I, I always have, um, I can't, pinpoint one place but i can tell you even going to like walt disney world when i was 10 years old looking at all the i was fascinated with all the the grandiose restaurants i was like wow like i want to own one of these one day um obviously the way i look at the industry has changed a lot since then but um i've always been fascinated with it yeah i grew up in a big family Uh, i was kind of you know fend for yourself so (laughs) yeah i mean i was i was making uh you know, egg drop soup at eight years old. All those little packets where you just kind of whisk in the egg. I mean, very things, but um, I always love cooking. And my, my siblings and I would create menus and uh, we'd charge each other, you know, based on which chores you didn't want to do. Um, so that was kind of my childhood with cooking. Um, growing up in, in the South, you know, naturally, I think there's a kind of connection to food and family and, and tradition. Um, and then you know, my first restaurant job was in high school at the Atlanta Fish Market. Uh, you huge restaurant. If you ever been to Atlanta and Buckhead, there's a, a huge copper fish. Yeah, yeah, sure. Front. Of um, course. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So so there's a there's a the restaurant side. I actually worked on like the, the market side, uh, where I got to learn, you know, a ton about fish. Um, I basically sold fish and was kind of a prep cook. Um and you know, loved like the uh the energy and and uh obviously that's something I think mean, attracts a lot of us to the industry. But um I, you know, after that I went off to college. Um got a master's in marketing, went to, to marketing. You said my marketing career, I don't know if I'd call it that. It was a, a very short-lived career, <laughs> um, a year and a half maybe. Um, it was all, I, I left there really because my my boss, uh, we didn't really get along. I probably would still be doing that if I had a boss that was a little bit more of a, of a leader versus just someone that was kind of uh, pushing papers at me. So I um, ended up moving up to Virginia where my cousin owned some restaurants. Uh, we opened one up together and um, yeah. Here we are. No, I love that. What What about during college? So, so a marketing moment <laughs> uh, versus career is better than no marketing moment at all, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I will say. So, I'm, I'm just curious. Back at uh, at uh, the University of Alabama, was was cooking something that followed you kind of through mm-hmm. your years there as well? Were you the, the 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 place everybody came to dine? I would say more of. I mean, yes, but more just restaurants in general. Um, I kind of did a little bit of everything, uh, cooking for sure, but also uh, front of the house, um, primarily kind of fine dining, which was, you know, I guess almost 20 years ago now. So fine dining in Tuscaloosa, Alabama is a little bit different than uh, big market uh, fine dining now, but um, for sure. Uh, and then even when I was doing the, the marketing, I, uh, my brother and I were doing kind of high-end dinner parties on, on the side. Um, so I kept, I kept getting drawn back into it. You know, like people joke so often that, that, uh, so many times people try and leave the industry and it kind of keeps sucking you back in. (laughs) That's kind of how it was for me. And and then finally I said, you know, like, let's do this. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. It's that passion. It's, it's, um, you know, not terribly different. I, I, I grew up in a, um, in a very restaurant centric family. My father came over from Germany. He's a, master pastry chef. So he was kind of on the pastry side, mm-hmm. but I did the same thing. I, you know, I went off, I went pack 12. I went to the university of Oregon, um, you know, just trying to find myself majored in business mm-hmm. and all that. But yeah, if it's in your DNA, somehow, some way, mm-hmm. you, you know, it kind of pulls you, but pulls you back in. What, what I love though is, and I'd love for you to kind of recount the, what was that profound moment? Because for you, it's not just cooking. I mean, I mean, as I go through your book a few times, I mean, you're talking about Dominique Crenn. I mean, you're talking about, like you say at the top, you know, the culinary elite, you know, this isn't just, mm-hmm. you, you know, the place down the street, you, you know, you talk about Gavin and, 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 and the others. I'm just really interested. Um, like when was that profound moment when you thought, you know, you hooked up with your cousins, you opened up a restaurant. When did you know that you wanted to be a chef and it was more, than just just cooking it was you know i want to know everything about this industry you you know when the food network launched back back in the day it was actually cooking shows it wasn't just like the the reality tv stuff i watched 
I mean, I remember vividly, like I'd come home from class and, and three o'clock was Tyler Florence. And then three 30 was Michael Chiarello and <laughs> eight o'clock at night was Emma Lagasse. Um, and so that was when I, I really was excited about cooking. Um, and it was, I think we were all exposed to it in a little bit of a different way. And, and then what I knew for sure was, um, so I'm, I'm in consulting. I, I really, I wasn't happy. I wanted to do cooking, but I didn't really see a path. You know, I, I kind of felt like I had to do this kind of nine to five thing. And then I see my cousin at my grandmother's 90th birthday party. And uh, he's like, hey, man, just so you know, if you ever want a, a job, you know, I got one for you up here in Virginia. And I was like, oh, OK, well, so I thought for about two days and then I text him. I said, hey, uh, I'm in. <laughs> yeah. And um, but but so it was it was definitely like that. Was, I needed I needed like a, a path in and he kind of gave that to me, which I'm grateful for. for sure. Yeah, we all need mentors. That, that 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 that's an interesting story. Are you glad that you did did it the way you did? College first, kind of understood, you know, what was available to you, and then you got drawn back into or into the industry. Um, I, I'm always grateful that I did do that, right? Because mm -hmm. I could have easily just you know, got behind the bench and always kind of wondered what it would be, be like to be a duck fan. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm always grateful that I experienced, you know, the whole thing. Um, cause it, it, it sort of completed me as I got back into the industry and I was mm -hmm. able to add some, some additional knowledge. Is that how it felt for you? Really happy that you went to UVA yeah. first? Yeah. I always think, I always think about what if I had, what if I had just gone the culinary school route and, um, I know I would be a different place who knows where, but um, I always look back and like I, I, another Steve Jobs quote, like you, you can only connect the dots looking backwards. And you know, people like look at me and say, well, what a waste. You went to college, you went to grad school, like for marketing, like you're not using that. Well, I'm using, I was an English major. So obviously I, mean, I use that for like the writing, um, understanding the language and then marketing, like building your brands and everything. So Absolutely. Um, a lot, a lot of times if you look on the surface, it doesn't seem like it's, uh, it's like, what a waste. But if you really kind of look back and think everything you did in the past kind of leads to where you are today. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. It's all part of the journey. So, mm -hmm. so you mentioned building your brand. So, um, marketing to the kitchen, building your own personal brand. What was again, for so many in interested culinarians, our students at Escoffier, that ask about this, go through our entrepreneurship program, so on and so forth. What was the vision for you specifically behind building your brand? So I, so first of all, for a lot of folks out there that are, that are listening, that might be students or, or maybe even further along, you know, we, we all start somewhere and, and, you know, my first blog posts and, and writings, you know, they got, you know, eight views and, you know, it was my mom and girlfriend at the time and sister. She probably refreshed it a couple of times to make me happy. Um, <laughs> so so it's, a, it's a process, right? Um, I knew, and I, I, my first blog, actually, I, it was called the Epicurean's Dilemma. It's out there somewhere. I hope, I hope nobody actually Googles that and reads anything, but I spelled the, I spelled the dilemma wrong uh, in the, in the title of it. So... <laughs> So uh, you don't have to get it right the first time, but I think the key is kind of getting yourself out there. And um, I know for me, when we opened up the restaurant, nobody knew who I was as a chef. I wouldn't even really call myself a chef when we first opened up. Um, but um, I started doing a lot of local TV. I started you know, writing about the industry and slowly but surely I started you know, building a following. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, I was listening to um, Chef Andre, you know, I had a conversation recently and uh, he, he was talking about um, he's, he had not need to do like cooking and recipes because there's a lot of people to do that. He found kind of his lane of like being like the, the culinary mentor. And I think I was able to kind of do the same thing. Like I originally had a studio kitchen and I was doing a lot of like recipes and it was cool and fun, but it's like how many more tuna tartar recipes do we need out there? <laughs> um, I wrote a couple of articles that kind of connected with people and, and, um, I said, wow, like people actually want to see this. So I think having a perspective, having your unique angle, and that obviously applies to the way you like you see cooking as well. That's why I think culinary school is a really good job of preparing you for is, is you get to see different types of cuisine. You get to see all different angles. And then 
as you kind of go through and maybe it worked for a couple of people, you start to figure out, well, this is going to be my cuisine. Uh, so I think understanding you have to have your own perspective and something that's kind of unique to you and your, um, your history, your family, your, your traditions, all those things. Um, otherwise, like you can get a sushi recipe anywhere. Yeah. You know, I, I, I love that conversation. That's probably a whole nother podcast and, and, and thanks for bringing up Andre. You, you know, we, we, spend a lot of time over, over the years talking about things like this, this whole idea that the majority of, I guess, the world um, thinks that they have to pull that recipe out and, and they have to follow. It becomes awkward in the kitchen, right? So you're trying to cook over here and you got it on your phone and then your phone times out or you, or you print <laughs> yeah. it. I, I, I've always been, and, and, and maybe that's the rebel in me a little bit, probably drove my father crazy as more of a scientist, a pastry chef, right? Mm -hmm. But the the whole idea for me was, um, and it sounds like the same for you, that you know, a, a list of ingredients just kind of kind of gets you going, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. It's it, it's you you can be intentional about whatever you want if you understand the technique, if you, mm -hmm. you know, if it's a grilling recipe or a sauteing recipe or a poaching recipe, whatever, you know, be true to that. Uh Augusta Scoffee would appreciate that. Mm -hmm. But the recipe itself you know, have some fun with that, you know, personalize that it's, I can't believe I'm even saying this, Chris, because it's the one thing that we have to keep the reins on our students with all the time, right? Because mm -hmm. that's exactly what they want to do. Because think, think about, think about what they're seeing on TikTok and Instagram and social media. It's immediate mm -hmm. gratification, right? It's like, oh God, I saw this recipe, you know, um, on, on, on TikTok the other night, I'm going to make it at school today. And, you know, that's where we always have to kind of like, well, like, like what's the technique and, you know, what sort of ingredients <laughs> are you thinking about? Right. So it, it, it's, mm -hmm. are, you know, are we going to put it on the menu? I can remember asking Curtis Duffy, like, oh, you know, I bet, I bet a lot of the people in your kitchen get excited and they kind of want to, you, you know, you, you know, try, try writing the recipe themselves. And, I'm, and, and, and so I asked Chris, uh, Curtis, are you, uh, are you open to that? Do you, you let others kind of build the, you know, the menu and he, it's just kind of like, yeah, no, I don't do that. <laughs> a lot, a lot well, of work goes into that, right? Yeah. Well, and like you and I can both go to a restaurant and have a certain dish um, and not even look at the menu and know kind of exactly how it was put together. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, like even a, I, I'm not fluent in French, but good enough to read a menu. Right. And that's mm -hmm. what I love about true French menus because they kind of tell you what's happening mm -hmm. in the description of the dish. So, so if you're able to enunciate that and understand it, it's probably going to be that technique. Right. Versus, versus now, like in any kind of modern American restaurant, it's like ingredient, <laughs> then like dot ingredient dot. And that's kind of what it is. <laughs> And it's dash. kind of it's kind of a surprise, right? So like mm -hmm. like how are they going to put this together? Yeah, oh, really, right. re really good point, really good point. So you know, Chris, the world that we live in today, um, where you have if if you have the right marketing skills or the team behind you with some social media uh, expertise, which I think is you know number one, um, mm -hmm. and then you sort of create that niche that you're willing to invest in. Um, it sounds like you can build a brand that can in fact reach the masses. Are there some really, really important steps? We make it sound so easy. Yeah, yeah, just go out there, build your brand, right? Um, but what are some of those, you know, things that you wish you could have a do-over or things that you just can't forget, things that are super, super important as you build a brand and most importantly, you scale that brand? Mm -hmm. Scaling is key, right? I mean, scaling, I mean, whether it's it's uh, your marketing or your systems, whatever, but being able to take it beyond just you know what we have here, um, I'll tell you one thing that my when we had my restaurant, yeah, Three Way Cafe. It was a, a gourmet sandwich bistro. We we did a, we did probably a couple hundred people every lunch and um, had some really interesting you know sandwiches. We had like a fig uh, fig glaze pork that we kind of slow roasted and sliced with you know smoked gouda and and like a kind of pesto aioli type thing. Um, and we had specials every day and I was always busy kind of putting the specials together, you know, giving, you know, putting them on a plate, getting ready for the staff to try and um, wasn't really able to kind of focus on the social media part of things. Um, but we'd always kind of share what our specials were. Um, well, they, instead of taking pictures of like the, the specials, 
they took a picture of this board where we kind of wrote them up there. And it's like, we have the food right here. Um, why would you just take a picture of the writing of what it is? Uh, and so I think that's an example of where you have to give something that people actually want to see, that people actually are excited to see, you know, like, especially when you, th when you think of food, especially like, like your dad, like in pastry, like, I mean, people love i mean that's one of the one thing that we all see on our social media feeds that we probably actually enjoy seeing whether we're you know chef or in culinary school or just a normal person is like is cooking and like you said the, the tiktok videos um but it has to be something that people want to see and, and engage with um there's too much kind of boring stuff that that isn't going to get somebody to stop so i think you have to ask yourself well what gets me to stop what, what gets me to watch this tiktok video maybe it's about cooking but it could also be if you're running running a kitchen like introducing them to your staff or um, kind of walking them through the specials or like um, you know, talking, maybe you have an, a conversation with one of your purveyors that kind of uh, gives a little bit of insights into uh, like the, the duck farmer that you had down the road. Um, there's a lot of interesting ways to kind of approach it that, that are able to demonstrate who you are as a brand and as a company um, or unique individual um, that give you the the person viewing it and, and seeing it uh, a full view of what you do and who you are you know you brought up a really good point that i hadn't even thought about right so you know go backwards to the food network right that was that was quite the phenomenon right it it mm -hmm. like all of a sudden these these big names that got bigger right and i can't remember if i watched the food network for the sheer enjoyment of 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 tyler and and an emerald and so on and so forth or was i trying to like i can do that i can do that do you mm -hmm. do you think things have changed from then 20 years ago to now tiktok are do you believe and and, and and again there's no grade on this but do you believe that most people are just watching these sorts of images and videos for pleasure or replication or education it's, 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 I never even thought about it until you brought that up. Like, why are they watching all this? Stuff? It's a, it's a, it's a good question. And I'm not sure I had the answer to it. Um, I mean, I know for me, I was, I was back in the day was watching, um, to, to learn, uh, but that was okay. also, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't gone to culinary school or anything now for me watching these things now. Um, it's different because I know how to cook now. Um, yeah. but now for, for the average person at home watching, um, I think there's a certain, obviously it has to be entertaining. It's entertaining. Um, and yeah. 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 And, and there, you know, you can hop on YouTube and, and see like how to set your video up in a way that's going to get it more traction, whether it's the title, you know, the, the intro, there's like these formulas, like, in, like, like a recipe, right? There's a formulas that, that you can pay attention to. They're going to help you to get more uh, engagement, more eyes, but I do. So I do think there's a certain entertainment value to it. Um, but I, I mean, I remember, but I mean, before I, you know, sold the, my share in the restaurant, we would do specials and I'd have, like, like you said, I have cooks come in and say, Hey, I saw this maybe on Instagram. I take back one around, but Hey, I saw this on Instagram and you know, we'd play around with it a little bit. Um, I'm not going to take, I, I'm, maybe it's just kind of the old school chef in me, but I'm not going to, take you know some guy that's like living in his mom's basement's recipe for you know, cinnamon roll pancakes and, and take and follow it to a t like sure, I could take sure. the idea and, and kind of work with it but um yeah so it's, it's a good question though yeah 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 i appreciate that um um i, I i'm curious too we've talked a little bit about kind of how you built your brand um if you can take us back again to when you were working in the restaurant and such, how did you build your, what was important to you to build your culinary skills? So was it a combination of everything we're talking about or just hard work? It was well, both. Yeah. Little, so little both, I, uh, yeah. yeah. So when I, when we opened up the restaurant, I was the chef partner, um, but okay. I wouldn't have called myself a chef till probably, I don't know, year three. Um, I mean, I was the, the person running, running the kitchen, but I didn't know, um, I mean, I knew how to build recipes and, and um, but I didn't know how to run a kitchen. You know, there's a, it's like the difference between being a cook and being a chef. Um, so there was a big learning curve that I had to kind of grow into. Um, 
I picked up different pieces along the way in different restaurants. Uh, by then, I'd probably worked in a dozen restaurants. Okay. Um, through, but also um, through events. You know, I encourage students all the time. Like, if there's events like locally, you can be you know volunteer with. It's a great opportunity to work with like really good chefs. Also, maybe get on, get on their radar. Um, but then also, one of the fortunate things I had was a commercial kitchen. We we closed early. So a lot of times at night, I would have the kitchen to myself where I could literally play around with new recipes. You know, I'd, I'd pull out the French Laundry cookbook and I would, you know, try your recipes that that um, were uh, kind of above my uh, pay grade at the time and um, got to kind of see like what, you know, my mentors you know, from afar were doing and um, put, kept pushing myself, you know, try micro gastronomy. Like at the time, there wasn't anyone locally that was doing it, but I got to figure out like different ways of doing things. And um, yeah, experience is a lot I, of it, but, Yeah. I love that. And I love the nod to to the great Thomas Keller. And the, you, you had a great post on, I, I don't remember when it was uh, on your Instagram where you kind of a little tribute to, uh, or, or or maybe that was your, your, your podcast, but you know, Thomas Keller, that book, if that book's not in your house, it should be in your house like immediately. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, that original one is, you know, like I was saying earlier, that in 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 my house, it might not be as tattered as yours, but I mean, we used it. We used mm -hmm. it. We brought it to the school. We brought it to the restaurant when I had that, and 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 we couldn't always follow the. Ex I mean, the ingredients were incredibly expensive, right? Mm -hmm. So so <laughs> we just kind of used the theme, right? Um, of 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 what Thomas was doing. So, gosh, I love that reference. I also love the reference. And, and, and our audience will probably think that we scripted all this, but we, we didn't, I mean, you're <laughs> this idea of working hard and, and working when the doors closed, right. And working in a dozen restaurants, right. It all sort of comes together. Um, it's not literally just watching a TikTok video and off you go, it, there's a lot of work underneath the surface, right. You know, it's, uh, yeah. it's a, calm bird floating on top of the water, but the, but the legs are going crazy underneath. So um, I just appreciate the, the, the passion of your response. Cause it's very similar to what we, you know, share with our students every single day. Right. Well, and, and as much as I love like all the attention out there and like mainstream media with, with cooking, you know, like there's like the hell's kitchens and like the top chefs and yeah, they do a little bit of a disservice to our industry. I think, um, you know, there's certain kids or whoever that want to go to culinary school because they want to make it big and you know, get on hell's kitchen. And, uh, you know, if you can do that, like more power to you, but for the other like 99 point, whatever percent of us, like there's a, a path that's going to be a little more traditional where we're going to have to kind of, you know, start as a dishwasher, then you're a prep cook and then your pantry, you work your way up. And, um, then at some point, you know, 10 years down the road, you look down and say, okay, like I'm actually like, you know, in charge of some people here. No, I love that. And and you address it in the book. You, you have one chapter called the reason you can't skip to the end. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I have that question later too. So we'll, <laughs> we'll come back to that. Um, I want to kind of jump in between. Um, I, I read, I read on, on the internet, some, some interesting, um, content around the bachelor kitchen. And I'm thinking <clears throat> what was, was that before the restaurant? Like, and 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 before you know becoming a consultant can you help me with the timeline where yeah that was how that came about yeah yeah so i um that was so we opened the restaurant in 2011 11, um and i started the bachelor kitchen about a year and a half before okay um okay I, uh, the, the blog that I, that I created before that, that I misspelled the name, um, <laughs> that was, um, it was getting some traction, but then I had this idea, well, like I'm a, I'm a, a younger guy. I'm a, I'm a, a, a bachelor. Like here's maybe like going back to the marketing, like wh what's, what can your niche be? Um, yeah, yeah. so, and then, so then I really thought that I could use that to, to bring attention to me as a chef and then in turn bringing attention to the restaurant so um that was kind of the, right before the restaurant but the, we kind of had been talking about it, you know like you know nine months out or whatever and it was part of like the intentionality of bringing people to the restaurant because i mean nobody knew who i was you know for the first you know six months it was crickets um but once i started getting more traction there was a direct correlation between that and um 
and um, the, the, the restaurant getting traction getting busier. I love the connection constantly back back to the branding, right to the marketing. So the journey, every step of the journey made sense. Um, I'm 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 curious. So you opened up three way your restaurant. You um, I've read that you were living very close by, and you know that brings up the whole notion of or the idea that a restaurant or any business really can take more than it gives, right? If you, you know, you're just constantly mm -hmm. there, particularly if you, you know, uh, Andre Sultan or like you live above the mm -hmm. restaurant, right? So <laughs> right. You, you never really leave the building type of thing. Um, any thoughts around that or what, and, and, and even advice operating a, a business that takes so much of your time and what you read about today is just trying to find that balance between work and life. And was that a, was that a difficult time or did you stay committed to keeping that balance? You know, I can only give advice looking back at what I didn't do. And um, <laughs> like, like a lot of cooks and chefs um, it's, it's hard. I mean, just the sheer nature of the hours is one thing, but then when your name's, you know, on the, on the wall or on the sign or, on the bottom of the menu, there's a certain kind of connect, there's a certain kind of ownership you have to it. Um, that's hard to kind of, so, I mean, I, I remember the first time I ever took any days off, I went back home to Atlanta for, for Thanksgiving and I, um, I was so nervous. I'm like, oh, like place is going to burn down. And, um, well, I came back and like, there was no bad Yelp reviews or anything like that. And, um, everything was just fine. Um, which taught me a good lesson of like, you can actually take some time off. Now I didn't, I didn't do that. And I wish I would have because my new girlfriend at the time, now wife, um, our relationship uh, suffered because of it. You know, like, I think that you see that a lot with folks in our industry. Um, I think it's also important to, to um, have other interests outside of cooking. Um, I mean, for me, the one thing I did do was I made sure that I got a good hour worth of being able to work out every single day. Um, good. even though you're kind of, yeah. running, even though you're kind of running around in the kitchen and getting like a, a decent workout, like being able to kind of just do disconnect for a little bit and not have to worry about, you know, phones coming in or vendors trying to you know, sit down with you. Um, so that was always helpful for me, but I think once you get done with work at the end of the day, like be done with work, don't, you know, um, and one good thing I think that we've seen a lot with, with, uh, and I try to talk about, about a little bit in, in making the cut is as much as I love like Bourdain, I, I think for a lot of folks like me that kind of came up when, um, uh, Kitchen Confidential came out, you know, he had the whole like kind of rock star, you know, party, like go out and listen, I, I mean, I did, you know, some of that. Um, but when you look at all these successful chefs out there now, maybe there's a, some exceptions, but for the most part, the ones in the ones I write about, write about in the book are really kind of put together. They, they get up early. They maybe work out. They have a, a decent, you know, family life. They have their priorities in line versus just kind of, you know, tying a, uh, or burn the candles at both ends. So, um, I think it's important to, um, to think about those kind of things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we we had a very similar conversation with Curtis a few weeks ago. It, yeah. it, it family's important, exercise is important, priorities, balancing it all because I mean it's a lot of hours, right? And and like you say, you try to get away for vacation or or a holiday mm -hmm. with your family, and you're thinking you, you might as well <laughs> just stay, right? You might as well just stay because you're thinking about it so much. What what was the motivation? You're in the restaurant, you're doing your thing. Mm -hmm you know, kind of like Bourdain, right? There, there was a point where he realized, wow, he's, you know, he could put pen to paper. So really, mm -hmm. really good author. That first book was insane. Right. Um, when, when did you know that, Hey, this is the route I'm going to go. Consulting is really important. I want to help others. I'm a good public speaker. I've, I've got a message. I've got a lot to say and heck I, you know, I can write really well. Um, was that just, was that a push or a pull? Was that real natural? Was that um, something your wife asked you to do? That sort of thing. <laughs> well, definitely. I mean, definitely, it makes it a little bit easier on like home life, right? You're not sure working all hours. You're not, um, and then you know, as as you get older, maybe I we don't have any kids yet, but like you have like Father's Day, Mother's Day, and and you know, holidays are, are important, especially when you have kids. So that's something maybe down the road. But you know, I think I do still have a restaurant left in me. 
Uh, but you know, I don't know if you, you ever read the article I wrote out there called Dear Chefs, and um, it's kind of an, an ode to, um, yeah, to yeah. kitchen work. And um, when I wrote that, um, it went kind of crazy viral, um, you know, got, I mean, a ton of views. I probably got a thousand emails the first month it, it came out. And, um, you know, the, the emails were from, you know, mothers of, of culinary school students and they were from um, spouses and, and, um, and grandparents and, and but also cooks and chefs. And, and um, when I saw the kind of response that I was able to get, I knew like, okay, like here's an opportunity to kind of connect in touch with more people. Um, and so that was a big part of it. Um, and yes, not, um, not having to kind of work the crazy hours of the restaurant kind of seemed appealing at the time because I was trying to kind of work on my relationship with my now wife. Um, but yeah, uh, I think I saw an opportunity based on some of the writing that I did, um, that then you know, that led to like a Ted talk and then, um, then like the, the audience grew and then I said, well, I have this big audience, you know, is there something I could make that they would like to buy? And then, you know, off to the book and it kind of goes from there. I love that. Can, can we talk a little bit about the, the transition to, to, to the Ted talk, um, you know, the, you know, doing what you love leading, mm -hmm. leading like a chef, uh, uh, you, you know, that scenario, how nerve wracking was that for you? I mean, that <laughs> well, so I, I've now I've done three now. Um, well, two, I'll say two and a half. The third one was Tech Santa Barbara, which was just an online thing, kind of like this. Uh, but uh, the one that's out there is a TEDx Tuscaloosa, and um, yeah, that, that was technically my second one. My, the first one I did was uh, TEDx Hampton Roads here in Virginia. But the, whoever did the uh, the media screwed it up, and they didn't actually they screwed up the recording, so it never made it out there, which is a great thing because I was like, I think that was the first time I ever gave a talk in front of people, so that was a good kind of trial run. Um, but yeah, so in the, in that talk, I, I talk about the, uh, the transition from being in the office and all that to then into the, the kitchen and, and doing work you love. And, you know, one of the kind of real keys there that I talk about is, uh, is connecting with the work, um, is, is doing work that you love. Um, and, um, if you, like you said before, if you're going to spend so much of your working hours doing it, make sure that you love it. And, uh, yeah, you know, I think when you look, we look at the uh, the COVID, where a lot of restaurants have obviously been str struggling with staffing, one of the good things that maybe came out of it was that all right, well, some people that weren't meant to be in our industry maybe moved along um, because if you, if you don't love it, you go drive a FedEx truck, make the same amount of money or more, have your weekends off, get your benefits, all that kind of stuff. So, um, really having the, the connection to the work, um, and that's yeah, that's. Uh, that's kind of where I found myself. It, I, I always try to tie it back to any, any kind of brief advice for, for students. Right. Um, again, it's that whole notion of, well, I saw this on TikTok or I watched, you know, Chris on Ted talk and, you know, I'm going to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it, you know, it's important that you, that you experience every moment along the way. Right. You didn't just go from zero to 60. I mean, you, mm -hmm. you, you have a very, um, almost scripted path that you took and it all kind of said made sense. Any, any brief advice for, you know, for students who, who think, wow, I like what he does. I want to write a book. Um, it's important to work in the industry first, right. To, to have the stories to share, to tell. For sure. For sure. I don't think any of the stuff that I've written, whether it's the book or, or articles would resonate with anybody. If I didn't, if it didn't come from a, a place that had, been through that, been through that themselves. Um, what you know, like you said, like it looks like everything's kind of neat and like trimmed and 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 uh, put together. But you know, when when we had the restaurant, we had opened up at the same time, which you don't see. Uh, is I was also working uh, in my cousin's other restaurant about 40, 30 to forty hours a week to pay the bills. I didn't get paid by the restaurant that I was a partner in for the first three years, um, which was a long three years, you know? Um, and I was, and I was still, you know, I was still like you know, driving through the tunnel that was two bucks uh, to go to the TV station. And I was getting up earlier to go do that. And, um, and 
you know, when I, when, yeah, I always think of it when I, you know, talk to, to students as well, talk about like, you know, so you have this kind of mountain in the distance and you know, the question is, you know, are you moving closer to or further away? And, you know, some days you'll move, you know, a number of steps and some days you'll move backwards, but overall, like, are you doing the things that are moving you towards the goals you have and, um, and know that it's going to be an uphill climb. Um, I don't know of anybody in our industry, maybe you, I, I can't imagine you do either Kirk that, has had an easy quote unquote path um, to to being an owner or being an executive chef and and uh, those kinds of things. Yeah, you have to put in the work um, with with that without doubt. I, I appreciate you sharing that very um, very humbling and very sincere. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't kind of gush a little bit about about the book. I, I learned about this book and, and, and you from one of our, uh, uh, head pastry chefs, um, and you, 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 chef, and he did a little, uh, little session for our students. So, um, belated thanks for that for yeah. sure. Um, but I gotta say, I, and here's the plug, right. Making the cut. Um, I mean, there's so much and, and, and it was probably very natural for you, but for me, a couple of things like the scratch notes in the back, Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Brilliant. I mean, chefs are always, you know, doing things like that. Right. Um, every book should have a, an area for scratch. Well, notes. Kirk, right? Kirk, that, that was also <laughs> to make it feel like it was a little bit of a thicker book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get a few more pages in there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, but these are the kind of books that, you know, like Andre, right. Andre put his PSA book out. Right. right. So I ordered a ton of them and I, I literally just passed them out. And I said, chefs, you know, chef instructors, this is for you. You know, this is not for um, for student consumption just yet because it's a little yeah. strong, right? So, but this will be the next that I pass out just because awesome, it's, it's really a fun read. And um, a couple of things that really resonated with me, page 72, what's your excuse? Uh, love the challenges. Um, getting attention um, or, or attention getting chapters, for me anyway, mm -hmm. the power of a decision when you talk about uh, Chef Gavin, right? Who, mm -hmm. like, I mean, oh my gosh! Um, I already mentioned I love the uh, the Steve Jobs quote, and I and I got to share it. Your work, your work is going to fill a large part of your life, and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. The only way to do great work is to love what you do. So profound. So we'll both thank mm -hmm. Steve Jobs for that. I mean, <laughs> yeah. absolutely amazing. I I think. Um, I was hoping that you could summarize just a little bit. I think my favorite chapter is the the reason that you can't skip to the end. I mentioned it earlier. What a great lesson for students, for for my 12-year-old boy who plays baseball and thinks he can start for the Cubs next year, right? Here there's a reason you can't skip to the end. Can can you speak to that just a bit? Yeah, so um you know, it's, to maybe take the sports analogy as well, um, you know, having gone to the University of Alabama, you know, our coach is Nick Saban and, you know, what they call, uh, you know, they call the process. And you know, the, the process is, you know, we're not going to focus on winning championships. We're going to focus on what can I do like this play in this moment, in this practice in, in April, that's going to then help impact us, you know, back down in hopefully January when there's a championship game. Um and so when you think of that, if you, if you, and that, if you apply it to the kitchen, like, what can I do like this shift? Um, this is going to make me a better cook, you know, not just today, but tomorrow. And, and the good thing about that too is, is compound interest. So like what you learn today, you build on and grow on for the rest of your career. So, so like, you know, hopefully you walk around with like a journal in your back pocket and you write things down. If you take, if you take one thing every day, then that's 200 things over the course of a year over the course of your career. That's a lot of things that you've learned. Um, and so, like I mentioned a few minutes ago, one of the things that the, like the Hell's Kitchen and Top Chef type world has done a little bit of disservice is try to get people to kind of skip those first couple steps. But the, you need, first of all, you have to go through them to kind of learn how things actually work, to be a better cook, to be a better chef. Um, but then once you actually do to get to run your own kitchen. And then like, once you get to the end of your career or like you're teaching whatever, like, like you and I are kind of doing now, like you appreciate the journey a lot more. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, th I think you lose sight of it. If you try to you know, skip too far ahead, not that you, not that you don't want to kind of push yourself because that's 
an important piece as well. But um, the journeys, I think that's what it's about, really. And I think you lose sight of it if you try and get there too fast. No, well said. Really good advice. And and again, you know, to your point, like this, this is what I have in the kitchen. I don't know if you could see that. It's called the Chef's Journal. I mean, mm-hmm. I got a hundred of them, right? In, yeah. in different colors. Literally, it's just kind of what what cooks do, what chefs do, what managers do, I guess, constantly writing notes down. So I, I, again, just brilliant. To, well, that you- and, well, I just want to say one more thing too. Um, and for anyone out there um, that hasn't seen it, I'm not sure Jeff, if you have or not, but um, you know, Rich Rosendale, there, there's a, a documentary on his uh, Boku's Door journey. Uh, it's called The Contender. Um, and they, they go back and interview, like they interview his, his chef instructors from school and they talk about back when he was in school, how he had all these crazy journals and notebooks of, of, of everyone, of ever, basically everything he'd ever kind of learned and, and, and discussed. And then um, they're interviewing him at the end, but it's actually before the competition. And he talks about like, he's like, the, the medals, they signify something I've been through, but what is meaningful is, is kind of who I've become along the way. Yeah, brilliant. The contender is amazing. Uh, ironically enough, Rich Rich is going to be on the show in a couple of weeks. So, oh, cool. It, you know, so we'll uh, we'll talk about you <laughs> as 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 well. Hey, we're getting a little close to the end, but I, I've I've got other things. Well, at least a couple of additional questions. I'm I'm really curious. Um, English major, University of Alabama, marketing, cooking. What is it about writing, particularly writing about food? and the people in the food business that resonates so, so much with you? You know, um, it's interesting because, you know, the, the process of cooking and, and seeing someone enjoy it is there's a certain kind of high to it. Um, mm-hmm. And then there's the, the side of, of thinking about the industry and connecting with people and it's kind of like the idea of like you get off of, of work and then you you have a shift drink together and kind of talk through you know, talk shop about how the shift went and everything and i think that's kind of what i'm doing through through the uh through the writing part of it is um is acting like we're all you know sitting at the bar at a, at a communal table talking about you know, the shift we just had together and um there's a certain kind of connectivity to it and camaraderie that uh you know it's like there's like like with like all the kids are saying these days if you know you know and it's one of those things where if you're a cook and and uh you've been through some of these things and some of these challenges then um then hopefully you can kind of connect with it so it's my way too of like maybe giving back to the industry in a way that um like we talked about before I, yeah i don't think we need another tuna and tartar recipe but if i can connect with people in a different way um I'm more than glad to do it. Well said. Well said. And really, really great job on the book. Can't wait for the next one. Um, well, I'm not going to let well, you go. Well, go ahead, Chris. I, I would say, um, I don't know uh, when folks are listening to this, but if any of the students or whoever wants to, to, to read it, I'll, um, it's going to be free from October 28th through November 3rd. Um, oh, that's, that's great. As, so just hop on Amazon, uh, ebook version and, um, yeah, that's great. There's going to be 8,000 students that uh, find out about awesome. that. <laughs> hey, before I let you go, it's such a great chat. Really, really great to get to know you. Um, but before I let you go, the name of the podcast is The Ultimate Dish. So in Chris Hill's mind, what is The Ultimate Dish? You know, having grown up in the South, um, having spent my summers uh visiting Charleston every year and, and um, you know, that's where I got engaged and um, a place I'm just super fond of obviously great culinary scene there. Um, shrimp and grits is my go-to. Um, I mean, I could eat grits by themselves um, every day, uh, but then you add um, <laughs> some shrimp and some, uh, some bacon fat, some uh, pork fat to it. Uh, I can't go wrong. So uh, some sort of shrimp and grits. I love it. I love that you t- stay true to the South as well. We we had a leadership conference in Nashville uh, a few months ago, and we had the the the, the good uh, the good fortune of eating with Chef Brock at uh, Audrey, oh, nice. and it was it was beyond spectacular. Yeah. It was unbelievable. Yeah, and he was incredibly gracious. He was there with us the whole night. 
Super cool. Oh, very cool. Yeah. He's what awesome. we expect from the South, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Chris, thank you so much for joining us. We'll have to chat again. Best Absolutely. of luck to you. And uh, we'll be in touch. I'm gonna going to get your words in front of our students real quick. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Kirk. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to the Ultimate Dish Podcast brought to you by Augusta Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. Visit escoffier.edu forward slash podcast where you'll find any materials mentioned during the podcast, including notes, links, and other resources. You can also browse other episodes and subscribe.